of half an hour. Um, and uh, if I don't use up that whole time, well then, you know, I suppose we could just bleed into a, a good productive conversation at the end about uh, Arctos data model or other data models in general. Um, but I want to preface that by saying I haven't touched a too much about data modeling, about agents and their aliases and such, a little bit. Um, but I want to kind of, kind of give you the, the lay of the land, at least from my perspective, about how one could do this out in the open. Um, and there are some you know, idiosyncrasies with how bi binomia is constructed that I hope be of use to you in terms of search and such. Um, but you know, anyway, so I'll, let's see if I can start sharing my screen and uh, then we can take it from there. Sounds great. So can we see that? Yes. Okay, great. If at any point my connectivity seems to have going through periods of hiccups or something, then please let me know when, and I'll backtrack um, because my internet connection can sometimes be a little bit spotty. Probably not quite as bad as John Rhetorics <laughs> where he is, um, but we'll 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 do the best that we can. So uh, a community-driven utility. I don't even know what to call it. A platform, utility, website, you name it. It's uh, a number of things. Um, but the intent is to uh, attempt to disambiguate people, uh, as mentioned in specimen data, when they get shared out to GBIF, as as Emily described. So this is something I put together about maybe three and a half to four years ago now as a pilot project, a uh, submission to the Ebby Nielsen challenge. Um, and um, since then, I keep poking at it and pulling at it and pulling on the string, trying to tease things apart in a little bit more interesting ways. And I hope there's going to be something here of utility to you. So linking people to specimens through the actions they executed. Uh, and the particular actions that I'm interested in in Binomia are two of them, identified and collected, but you can imagine all manner of other kinds of actions that an agent or a person might execute on, uh, on a physical specimen. But these are the two that I was particularly interested in because they have natural representations in Darwin Core, in recorded by or identified by. There are a few others within Darwin Core, like georeferenced by, that I've, I've not uh, attempted to tackle within Binomia. So if you were fortunate enough to sit uh, through John Rhetorics and um, Tim Robertson's discussion this morning for you, if you were on the West Coast, very early for Emily, uh, about the rearticulation of GBIF's uh, grand unified model in support of um, primarily physical specimens, but also digital objects as well. Um, but there's one particular slide that uh, John and Tim shared that was uh, piqued my interest. And uh, I see signals here that uh, in John's involvement in Arctos um, about this aspect of agents and roles and their relationships. Um, and that one of the boxes in the middle there, agent role, is something that I put a little bit of thought into um, just as I'm sure you have as well. And I take a slightly different approach with that, with some background in working with the um, RDA group, uh, our Research Data Alliance. Um, there was once an active group, be joint group between the Research Data Alliance and TADWIG, kind of the Taxonomic Databases Working Group, uh, about attribution and the curation and maintenance of research collections or research objects. And the slightly different approach here, unlike that entity relationship model that John and Tim shared, um, the slightly different approach um, is a splitting apart of that agent role into an activity and an optional role. And so I tend to think about activities as verb-based words rather than the uh, oftentimes uh, overloaded term like recorded by or identified by, but just try and split that up and, and use action-based words for that activity, like identified, collected. Um, and that has implications. I don't think that the two approaches are incompatible whatsoever, um, but uh, by splitting them out a little bit, it affords a, um, a slightly different approach um, that uh, would accommodate potentially many, many other kinds of actions. 
so in Binomia, what happens is that all the specimen data would come from GBIF, they get presented, all 180 million of them, uh, and blasted out on the screen for someone to say, yes, that's my specimen, that's my specimen, I collected that one, I identified that one, and those actions are the clicks. Uh, you know, the, the, the little net on the left is the action for having collected it. And the microscope in the middle there is the action for identified it, um, and or both, right? I was both the collector and the and the and the determiner of that particular specimen. You could imagine a world where there are many many other kinds of actions there that you might want to be able to attribute or link a concept of a person uh, to the particular actions that they've taken. Um, and so role is a slightly different kind of approach within the RDA model, and that is more of a refinement of the action. Uh, and kind of grappling about, you know, this particular aspect of it. And the reason why I'm always uncomfortable about using the role is that it tends to be, uh, in the minds of many people, associated with their position in, in, the, in an organization. Even though that's not the intent at all whatsoever in this particular uh, realm. Um, but uh, there are still opportunities for refinements of, of what particular uh, role somebody had in the execution of an action at a particular time or a span, uh, you know, a, a, a range of times. And so um, what I'm currently engaged in doing is trying to figure out how to construct with my colleagues a, uh, an extension to Darwin Core called Agent Actions. And one of the optional roles in a controlled vocabulary is things like primary collector role or secondary collector role, which is a, a refinement of the collected action. So what about some of the other actions? Um, and so um, me and colleagues have been uh, producing a list of particular action-based words that we think are relevant in our domain. Illustrated, distributed, preserved, transcribed, prepared, measured, georeferenced, et cetera, et cetera. So all, all, you know, all those words are very familiar to you. Um, and so we're in the, in the midst of nutting out you know, precisely what we mean by these particular actions in a, a Dar an extension to Darwin Core. Um, hopefully that, that extension will be produced very soon, um, probably hopefully by, by the end of the summer. So I want to back up a little bit. Um, and I want to introduce you to some vocabulary that I use. If it's of use to you, wonderful. If not, ignore it. Um, but I tend to um, try and be a bit precise in my use of terminology, uh, probably not um, in a way that is very useful to a lot of people, but at least it gets my mind in the right kind of space. And I kind of tend to separate what I mean by an agent or an agent string or a person. Uh, and so for my purposes within Binomia, what I'm calling an agent string is uh, a sequence of Unicode characters. Might represent a person, might represent an organization, might represent a piece of software, but what it doesn't have is any linkages to some kind of external, unequivocal expression of identity. Uh, so it's you know, Mrs. Smith's grade four entomology class, if there was such a thing, an agent string. And so, you know, if you want to translate that into English, that means for my world, it's ambiguous and you, your friends can't necessarily agree on who that person was. There's no, there aren't many opportunities to share uh, what we mean by that agent string in an unequivocal way. Whereas a person is an agent string <laughs> with one or more unique verifiable identifiers that conveys some sort of uh, discoverable shared concept of identity. So it's unambiguous and your friends can agree. So that's kind of the distinction when I say between agent string and person. But it's comparable to, in, in a sense, to the Oftentimes the words we use uh, scientific name string versus taxon. Um, and disambiguation, what do I mean by that? Um, well, that is a process um, that uses evidence to assert that an agent string in association with some kind of entity that executed an action is a person. And um, Quentin Groom and myself and about uh, 13 other 
co-authors are in the midst of preparing a, a manuscript uh, for submission very soon within the next couple of weeks about the disambiguation of people names and bio and biological collections you know what what kinds of things do you need to have in mind and what are what are the processes that are most effective uh, for this disambiguation process and we're really quite pleased about how that's progressing so here's the grand vision in cartoon form for bionomia so on the upper left you have specimen data emerging from uh, individual collections shared out to GBIF. And uh, of course, those aren't empty labels. <laughs> but for the purposes of what I'm trying to do here, for all intents and purposes, that recorded by or identified by are blank, unknown people, uh, agent strings. And the intent is through bionomia to try and disambiguate who those people are on those specimen labels, apply uh, disambiguation processes in the minds of the people that are going through this process and attach things like an ORCID identifier or Wikidata Q number onto those uh, labels, if you will, and permit that to flow back into the institutions and around and around and around this cycle might go. And that synchrony and how that would work, still sorting out how that is best coordinated, and this is partly the reason why we're all here today, is to figure out how this might work. Um, all kinds of technical challenges, um, but we're getting there. Uh, there are signs from half a dozen uh, institutions in uh, Norway and Sweden who are making use of the outputs from Binomia and turning them back into their collections management system alongside the identifiers for these individuals and some other tools and services within Binomia that would make that process worthwhile. Um, so here's how things are working so far in Bionomia, and it's a nice progressive, uh, a nice progression, um, easily manageable for a one person to try and maintain the informatics and the infrastructure behind it. It's not gone up exponentially, it's been nice and steady. Um, there have been some, to date, four million claims, as I call them. So you, you log in with your ORCID identifier and you get presented with candidate specimen records that, hey, are these yours? <laughs> and there's been four million of those kinds of actions of, uh, of declaring, self-declaring. Yes, I collected that one. Yes, I identified that one. Um, and um, within Bionomia, it's, it's open so that you can attribute specimens to other people not just claim your own but saying oh yes i know that was derek sykes specimen he collected that in alaska in 1922. <laughs> an erroneous attribution i would assume um but at least uh there's the opportunity for others to participate even though they may not have collected any specimens at all but they know who that individual is they know their their expertise they know the work that they've done and there's been some 20 million of those um attributions that have been made uh, to date um and some uh 1600 people who have visited at least once uh since 2018 um 800 or so have made their profiles public and some 43,000 profiles have been sucked in from wikidata and some 16,000 pro uh, profiles have been sucked in from orchid and I make the distinction within Bionomia for a number of reasons that ORCID identifiers are for the living and the Wikidata identifiers, the Q numbers, are for the deceased um, for a whole, whole suite of reasons, mostly because I don't want to be embroiled in the kind of privacy issues that are involved in, in this kind of process. Leave it up to ORCID to sort those details out and Wikidata to um, have a free-for-all where there are other maybe some biographical information that, within Wikidata that are of immense interest to us. Uh, anyway, so um, about 181 people have been engaged in attributing specimens to other people. And as I mentioned, some 16 million, 20 million of these linkages have been made. Um, and to my amazement, there have been a number of people that have attributed well over a million, two million, three million specimen records to people. And here I've, I've shown up some, some superstars in this whole process who are really enthusiastic about this. Um, and as I mentioned, there's a, some 180 other people that ha have done the same. So there's some activity here and, and it's nice to watch. 
So I want to split the, the, the next bit of the talk um, into four main sections uh, about how this whole thing works. Um, and I'm going to touch a little bit on some of the mechanics and the technicalities behind it in terms of parsing people's names. How do you search for people's names? Uh, synchrony with the sources from where the data come from, from GBIF, and where they come from with ORCID and Wikidata. Some tools and services that are rolled into Binomia that kind of give a, a little bit of a positive feedback loop um, in terms of, of how things will progress. And then I'll, I'll finish it up with the round trip, um, how we kind of synchronize this loop. So parsing and searching. Um, right from the get-go, um, what I've attempted to do is create some aspects to this whole process that can be used well outside the context of one project. Um, there are there's needs to parse people's names, for example. How do you do that? Uh, and so, borrowing from uh, a number of projects um, that are clearly well outside our domain, who do this as well, um, I've latched on to a, a particular. Ruby gem um, that is used mostly in bibliometrics to parse out the people's names as authors for papers. Um, and I've bolted on a bit of a, an add-on to that gem called NAME uh, to add a, a few bits and pieces of regular expressions to try and push things along in a way that is suitable for the, the data that appear on specimen labels, because this is very different than what you would normally see in the list of authors in, in publications. Um, so kind of enhance that. Uh, and so here's a, a little Ruby gem, a little library that can be used command line, uh, or it can be used uh, uh, services um, outside the context of Binomia. And hopefully that's, that's of use to some people. Who, who work in the Ruby world. Um, and so how that emerges in Binomia is um, a, 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 as a means to supplement search. Um, and so you, you type in Oliver and up comes a, a number of hits in there. And although the, that, that, that the demographic data and the uh, births of, you know, uh, dates of birth, date of death, statements about who these people are, come from Wikidata or ORCID and presented to give you a little bit of context about you know, who you might be searching for, not just a straight list of names, but there's also some kind of context that's immediately provided there to the users. And I make heavy use of Elasticsearch for this and a little library in JavaScript called Type Ahead. Uh, and it seems to work relatively well. So I have little pictures of people there as well <laughs> that kind of appear in the search. And that search itself, um, can be reused and put in other contexts well outside this project. Uh, and so you could use it. And, and the response that comes back from that on a, on a click event that a person has chosen something will be the identifier. So you can capture that and make use of it wherever that, that search might be useful for you. So it's not just immediately useful in one project. Hopefully that, that little search widget might be used somewhere else. Um, so here's a, a little bit of technicalities of search uh, in Elasticsearch. Uh, it's amazing. So if you use Elasticsearch or Solar in, um, um, in, in Arctos, wonderful. There are some amazing things that can happen in there that make use of, and one of which is, well, what about nicknames? You know, do we really want to be typing out people's nicknames and storing those independently of everywhere else? Or could we actually make use of a library? Or <laughs> people have done this before and use a synonyms file within the search engine itself that would allow you to en enrich the search. Um, and likewise, way over on the, on the right are how you construct in machine language there an elastic search about how, how you do search. And so you can give particular weights to the family portion of a name or the given portion of a name or the full name itself and do some autocomplete magic in there and rank names based on uh, their pre-existing attachments to other items, such as, you know, family names of taxa. Um, so that would give some boost to people's search results, depending on, on the context that you're working in. And so here's this little synonyms text file 
built deep within the engine of elastic search and binomia that has all these little mappings of nicknames. And so that would supplement and facilitate the search for particular specimens without having to maintain necessarily a whole suite of alias lists if there's pretty commonly associated nicknames to people. Uh, and you know this is open on, on GitHub, and so we can add nick no nicknames in one place uh, rather than having it narrowly defined within one project. And, and do it multilingually, <laughs> hopefully, not just you know, the, the traditional English nicknames. Um, and likewise, um, some other little bits and pieces within the Ruby gem that I have that would give some scoring to the actual structures of names. So given a name like M.E. Smith, M.R. Smith, M.S. Smith, clearly those are all three different people, you would hope. Um, but can you actually give some scoring to that uh, to give some quantification about how uh, the structure of those names it's themselves. And so within Binomia, I'll do some pre-parsing of all people that have exactly the same family name. And, and then likewise, all of the given, given names or portions of given names associated with those family names and score them all relative to one another. So that when you get presented with specimen records in order to link them, um, you can eliminate some of the cruft that would ordinarily be presented with um, unintelligent search. So synchrony with sources, um, how do we do that? Um, so as I mentioned, the, the, the names lists that uh, I am listening to come from both ORCID and Wikidata. Uh, and that presents in and of itself some interesting challenges. Um, the two main questions that I ask and pings to both of these resources is, what's new that I don't already have and what's changed since last I checked? Because I've been interested in pulling in some information about these people. I want to know, keep it up to date, keep it fresh within Binomia so that there's a, at least some synchrony with those sources. And I've got scripts that operate on a daily basis to pull in that information, keep it as best I can synchronized with those sources. And if you want to know more about that, I've got a, a link that I can share a little bit later uh, of a presentation I gave to the LD4 Wikidata Affinity Group about the mechanics of maintaining synchrony with sources like that. And over on the right is GBIF. This is where the specimen data come from. And on a bi-monthly basis, I completely refresh all the current current data within Binomia. Um, I wish I could do it daily, <laughs> but I, that's just too difficult. Uh, two, you know, twice a month seems to be about the the sweet spot for me and the, and the time commitments that I want to put into it. And thankfully, GBIF have produced a, a custom download for Binomia that's an Avro-based download. Those 180 million records that facilitates the processing at, at my end, uh, that then I go about parsing the names and associating those agent name strings with particular records to facilitate the, the, the linking that people then are engaged in doing. And all the, the code for that is open source. So tools and services. What can we do when you start making linkages between people and their specimens and declaring their actions like that? Surely there's some creative ways that we can make this and uh, accelerate this whole process even more. Uh, well, one of which is, well, just the parsing of the names is a service in and of itself. Um, so that's one tool and service is you can paste a bunch of names, parse them out, download the CSV, and away you go or you can do so via an API that's also available within Binomia. It's not perfect by any means. There's all kinds of messes that appear within our data and recorded by, identified by, but it does a reasonably good job. There are uh, spec tests behind this, and there's some 480, 490 spec tests that I've written there. And oftentimes I'll come into problems that hey, this one didn't work, and I'll go write a spec test, uh, and then improve it and make another release for that parsing tool and deploy it onto the website itself so that the, a the API and, and the website for this parsing tool uh, work. Uh, what about reconciling names? Um, well, there's also an open refine uh, reconciliation endpoint uh, for Binomia, just as there is for Wikidata. I would recommend you use the Wikidata one because it's, it's probably a lot more efficient and useful, but nonetheless, there's a, a more domain specific one with this reconciliation endpoint for Binomia. Seems to work relatively well, uh, pleased with it. Um, what about integration somewhere else? So I'm toying around with, well, can we actually manipulate the GBIF pages 
and actually show the linkages with the people and their identifiers on the GBIF page itself. Um, and you can toy around with um, browser extensions to do those kinds of things. And so I've got one for Chrome, one for Firefox, and you can install it. And then when you go visit an occurrence page in GBIF, you can see immediately up at the top there, not only the list of people that and the actions that they took, they collected identify, but I'm also kind of sucking down all of the downloads that have been made to GBIF in reference to the primary literature and associating those with those people as well. And I'll show the list of publications on any one occurrence, occurrence record within that extension as well, which is kind of cute. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier for developers, this autocomplete search widget and the response that comes back will be the identifier that person uh, that, you know, you're welcome to try and toy around with that to see if it might be useful for you. And now the round trip, you know, the meat of all of this. How do we do this? Um, I was very pleased to see that John and Tim uh, are looking very seriously at frictionless data uh, and uh, me too within Binomia because it allows the many to many relationships that uh, we really desire in some cases. Uh, and so for each of the data sets that come down from GBIF and appear in Binomia using exactly the same UUID as was presented on GBIF, not making anything new here, um, I have the frictionless data download as a bunch of zipped up CSV files uh, for each of those data sets. And here's one I've shown for the Den Denver Museum of Nature and Science, the entomology collection. So within that, there will be a, a relatively flat list of people. And so they will include the Wikidata identifier, the ORCID identifier for the Wikidata individuals. There will be a birth date, death date that's been pulled down from Wikidata. Um, and so that's a nice flat list. So if you've got a person table in your data set, um, then you can cross-reference it against that one very simple CSV file. If you're additionally interested to see who made linkages between a person and, the, and their actions that they took on that specimen, there's an attributions CSV file in there. So you say it was Siobhan Leachman who made that link on such and such a date and time, and this is what she did. Um, so that may be useful. And likewise, all the occurrences that were of relevance in this data set are included in there. And problem collector dates. <clears throat> so if you've gone to the business of pulling down birth dates, death dates from Wikidata, and you can cross-reference them against the event dates or the dates of determination on those specs, what can you do with it? <laughs> Could you pinpoint possible errors in that? And so it made some exploratory uh, queries in Binomia about doing those kinds of things. So in there, and that problem collector dates will be a little goodie there to see, well, these, these records have been attributed in such and such a way to so-and-so, but there's a problem with the dates here. You might want to go back and have a look at these things. And it's not one-to-one, on, one -one, you know, one record at a time. It's going to be a bulk of them. Here's 50 records that need to be examined. Um, so here's what the people CSV looks like, no magic, but there will be a name, family name, given name, alternate names, so those aliases, if you will, have come from ORCID, they've come from Wikidata, and then the link, the same as link to ORCID or Wikidata, and what you're not showing here are other columns in there for birth dates, death dates, that have come from, from Wikidata. Attributions, um, and these are also the claims made, so here's Frank Thorsten Krell claimed such and such a specimen record on such and such a date. Here's his ORCID ID uh, and the action that he took. You know, he identified this thing uh, and, he, and he said so, right? Um, and here's a, an example of problem collector dates uh, where I've attempted to denormalize this a little bit to give some context in this. So it's not just purely relational in this file. I'm also pulling in other columns in there to kind of facilitate the examination of weirdness in dates. So catalog number, wiki data, Q number there, birth date of that particular individual and the precision with which that birth date is expressed and the event date and the year. And I think I've, um, so these are particularly tuned to the collectors. I've not yet included the dates of determination here in the same sort of way, but you know, it's something I might want to investigate as well, but at least for the collectors, here's, five examples from that Denver Museum uh, and an entomology collection where there's a mismatch. There's something bizarre going on with the dates. 
um, and, a, and a visualization within Binomi itself as a timeline. Red bars, there's a problem. Blue bars seems to be okay. And if you click on the red bars there and say, aha, uh -huh, Beatrice Vogel uh, has been attributed, uh, she's collected this particular specimen in 1898, but she was, she was born to the world in 1930. So there's a, something that needs to be examined in there. So how then would stuff emerge out of assuming that you are uh, sufficiently interested in trying to acquire those identifiers and looking at the goodies within Bionomia there, um, how then could you have that emerge back out into GBIF? Well, there are a bit two new terms in Darwin Core ratified called recorded by ID and identified by ID, where you can put a pipe separated list of those identifiers for those people and flow it back out into GBIF. So uh, you would hope, you know, maybe if, if we're really successful in all of this, there is no need for a binomia anymore. It just evaporates um, because now we have the opportunity to share identifiers for people back out into the world and cut binomia completely out of the picture, um, which is ultimately, I think, where we, we would want to go. Um, so there are other ways to play with this. Hopefully this is a, of interest to you. Uh, as a bit of a coda, what can we can we use what we know and apply it to what we don't know? Um, and so, one way we could do this is not just look at individual people, but to look at the specimen record itself and draw in what we know of all prior linkages that have been made and present to the users uh, boosted confidence in the likelihood that a particular DJ Galloway is probably David John Galloway because there's already been a linkage made between B.J. Coppins and David John Galloway on another record somewhere else. Uh, and so to facilitate that linking, they draw in what we know and fill in the gaps of what we don't know and in a little bit more of a performant way. Uh, and so finally, let's do this with a purpose. Um, and there are all kinds of contexts within which uh, we can kind of facilitate this linking of people. And uh, I've been thankfully participating in a few workshops about this, one in 2020 about trying to examine the bat collectors of the world as a little pilot project um, with I Dig Bio with some funding from the NSF. Um, and we got a group of people together who were bat biologists and said, let's look at all the specimen data, see if you can figure out who these people are. Um, and it worked really well. Uh, another one um, about a week and a half ago, I guess, um, using Wikidata to capture and share information about people in paleontology it was organized by um, Eric Krimmel and her colleagues who were um, not necessarily interested in binomia, but really interested in what's happening in the world of Wikidata. Uh, and of course, eventually binomia would take advantage of that because the data are being sucked in from Wikidata. And finally, I wanted to draw your attention to a workshop uh, that is taking place in spinach uh, in June, uh, entitled People are Unique, Unique, Unique People are uh, Priceless, where we're going to explore a little of this uh, reconciliation and uh, disambiguation of people even more. So I'll leave it at that. Hopefully I gave some opportunity there to talk about data models. I don't stop sharing my screen. Sorry, I wasn't paying any attention to the chat whatsoever. <laughs> great, well, thanks so much, David. That was really great. Um, I, yeah, I personally see a lot of opportunities uh, for integrating some of, some of these tools uh, in Arctos in terms of um, disambiguating people and, and creating sort of uh, error reports. Uh, yeah, let's look at the chat. So Marielle, I think chimed in and feel free to unmute. Uh, she chimed in about eat curation yeah. as an agent. Oh yeah, there you go. I started, I put that there just because uh, I needed to write it before I forgot. <laughs> so didn't to interrupt. But um, yeah, um, you had, we're talking about the Tadwood group and the agent and the roles of various um, uh, people. And um, one of the things that I saw that was missing was and something that we're trying to deal with is 
um, something acknowledging sort of curation steps or curated by as a potential verb. Um, and But then thinking about what the talk this morning, John's um, and Tim's talk, it seems like sort of more broadly, it's more of an assertion. It, it's an asserted by, and there could be a lot of, that would be the verb, but there could be a lot of things that people are asserting. They could be asserting reproductive measurements were taken on this date by this person who asserted that these were the actual reproductive me measurements or an event or, so there are all kinds of things that we capture in our, that um, various attributes and various things that are essentially assertions that some of them are related to curatorial steps, some of them are related to the process of collections, et cetera, outside of just collecting and preparing uh, or identifying that I didn't know if you had also, that was on your radar in terms of things to capture. Well, this most, most definitely gets us into annotation space. And um, it's partly the reason why we've stalled a little bit on the agent actions Darwin core extension that we started within our group about maybe, oh gosh, about two years ago now. The incapacity to express those kinds of assertions um, as an annotation is what's kind of holding us back. I mean, it, it's difficult to, I want to be able to say that Siobhan Leachman made the link and she made it on such and such a day. And this is what she asserted. And there are all the kinds of reasons for making those kinds of statements uh, as a, a, a provenance kinds of chain. Um, and um, I'm not sure how best to tackle that at the moment. Clearly we need an, an annotation kind of framework in order to do that well, um, but we do not have one um, in, that, in that global context at the moment. So I'm pleased so you have, you know, so those kinds of solutions built into Arctos, and I would, I have no idea how best that we, we could distribute that and and make it available to others. I've got a question, somewhat of a follow up on that. Um, it's it's an issue that has been kind of plaguing me uh, for a long time. Um, that in and it's directly relevant to binomials, um, you know, identified by that you're capturing. Um, so there's the traditional sense of identified by, and this person looked at this specimen and decided what its um, its name was. Um, then there is this sort of curatorial identified by, which happens as your data set grows older and taxonomic names change. Mm -hmm. and you update, oh, here's 3,000 bumblebees that are no longer called Bombus occidentalis. Now they're called Bombus mckayi because the species right. has been split in two. So I'm just going to update the database. And now I'm suddenly the identifier of mm -hmm. Bombus mckayi. 3,000 specimens, I haven't looked at them, right? Yeah. So these are two very different things. Um, and yet our, our database, and I don't know if there's any database that does a better job, um, doesn't really have a great way of separating that. We do have a, um, a, a field that kind of qualifies it, you know, identified with uh, audiovisual or identified as a revised taxonomy. So Arctos does, we, we can say, okay, this is revised taxonomy name change rather than, you know, I looked at it under a microscope. So we, we do have a way of recording it, but I don't think that makes it out to GBIF or really gets um, appreciated or, or noticed. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that problem. But I, I'm in full agreement with that. I mean, what, what we're striving for is transparency in, in how the information gets expressed and the disconnect between the application of the scientific name to a specimen and what happens downstream and the layering of all those assertions, if you will, over and over and over, slightly different. We don't want to lose the context within which someone has assigned a particular scientific name to a specimen that must remain, um, you know, when the concept changes over time, regardless of whether you've looked at that, that physical specimen or not, uh, there must be a mechanism to express that. I mean, of course, we do have the identification history extension in Darwin Core, 
where some of that nuance can be captured, where you can actually have the scientific name expressed there alongside that quote unquote identified by. Um, but you're absolutely right. And at, at, at the moment in binomia, that is a deficiency. Um, what needs to happen there is a much tighter association with the scientific name and identified by. And I've been toying around with you know, an, an expansion panel. <laughs> don't yet know how best to do this, where the, the, that nuance can be more appropriately captured. Um, and uh, there's gonna be some form of a migration path in order to accommodate that. I have no idea what it is yet, um, but you're right. I think there needs to be perhaps a refinement or an enhancement to that Darwin Core uh, uh, archive extension for identification history to accommodate this. And, when I see on GBIF, there's, there's, you know, of course you're seeing the expression of that Darwin Core Archive extension for identification history is way down at the bottom of the page, but you lose sense of the context with that um, um, because, well, you know, there is one name at the top of, the, of an occurrence page at GBIF, for example, um, and may not be necessarily reflective of the, um, the most recent application of a scientific name, whether or not that, that specimen was examined or not. There's a lot more work, I think, that needs to be done there. Hopefully that some of that is going to emerge with uh, to redesigning of GBIF, but clearly there's naivety in the, in the binomial way of doing things at the moment. Thanks, yeah, it's really, uh, really cool that you're also pulling in all the citations and linking it all together, very nice. I have another question if no one else is um, going to ask, and that's regarding how you deal with institutions and people who are affiliated with institutions. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that you have, like, for example, the our institution that I'm working at, the Museum of Southwestern Biology is in Bionomia, and yet there are only two people affiliated with that um, institution, uh, and I'm even though I, I, I'm part of that institution, I, I, I'm not in there. Do I need to manually add some, myself or, and my fellow collection managers and staff, or is there some potential way to automate that? Right now, for um, we put our ORC IDs in Arctos and that automatically populates um, information at Bionomia. Is there something else that you would need to make that happen with the institutions? Yeah, so that, that there's, you know, again, I kind of, associate these with the kind of exploratory way of looking at things from slightly different angles. And so those institutions and organizations and your affiliations have come from ORCID. Mm. And um, ORCID is still in a bit of a, a transition at the moment. In the past, maybe two or three years ago, they made use of an identifier for institutions that was uh, commercially based um, called Ringgold. Um, and which is now realized that because there, there wasn't any solution for that in the past, uh, unlike what we have at the moment when there are other new emergent open identifiers for organizations, one called ROAR or R-O-R. Um, and so what we would need for all those bits and pieces to work properly is that when you, when you maintain your ORCID ID um, to have your affiliations in there, when you go through that process of choosing the organization that you're affiliated with, ensuring that you know the ROAR ID or the other identifiers that are being used there are present. And then when synchronized in binomia, they get pulled in. Say, ah, okay, now I know that organization, I can cross-reference it against Wikidata, um, and then I can at least demonstrate that there are these people associated, affiliated with these organizations because of that, the presence of that identifier. Does that, that help? Yes. So basically, we need to do that through ORCID. And, yes, that's correct. Um, and, and likewise for Wikidata, it's the same kind of process. Well, so in this instance now, um, you could, there's nothing preventing you from having a, a, a Wikidata identifier for a living person. By all means, go ahead and do that. But in terms of the, the binomial perspective, it kind of puts a full stop I mean, ensuring that is this person 120 years old or less? Um, are, or have they died at a particular date? And likewise, their affiliations um, when they were living 
can be expressed in Wikidata, those two get drawn in into binomia. So you can see present uh, people who are currently active in those those organizations and in the past. And so you can see both. Um, and again, I'm using those identifiers that are present for those organizations. And can you accommodate sort of hierarchies of organizations or, or more That's than an one? That's an ongoing challenge within ROAR itself, is how do you do that? Uh, and I do not know whether or not they've accommodated that sufficiently, um, but you know, it is what it is at the moment in terms of how we could possibly make use of it. Um, perhaps if uh, the GBIF registry uh, of organizations and collections also starts um, uh, thinking about this, uh, and if they were to make use of Wikidata, you know, hopefully that kind of hierarchy would be present as would be possible in Wikidata. Within Roar, you know, I do not know. So Wikidata might be a better situation if you have a person who has changed between multiple institutions over time and that's have right. a place to log it all in one place. Yeah, that's right. Because um, you can declare start time, end time, mm -hmm. uh, and bracketing the, the, the time with which they were affiliated with those organizations. Okay, thank you. You mentioned having, um, there's a Swedish institution, I believe, that's making use of Bionomia, and I was wondering, are they, um, how, what does that look like? Are they using the Bionomia identifier next to each person's name or kind of, are they ingesting that, that um, frictionless data package and, and really integrating a lot of the tools? Yeah, there, there's one really enthusiastic individual who is an early researcher who is a um, an assistant curator at, uh, I've forgotten the name of the organization now, but it's an herbarium in Sweden um, who, um, yes, does draw in the identifiers in that people table, in that CSV file, and then adds them to their agents tables within their collections, but also looks at the problem collector dates um, and uses that every time I refresh the data in binomia, he's one of the first ones to go in and say, <laughs> okay, I fixed those errors. Do they still appear in binomia? Um, and so he's very enthusiastic about that, uh, about cross-referencing the, the collector dates and, um, with their own, their own holdings. Um, there's been not a whole heck of a lot of activity in terms of examining the attribution CSV files. So that's uh, you know, quite a deeper level in terms of looking at you know, who is it that made this link between that person and when did they do it and can I trust it? Um, it's available, but I haven't seen too many signs of that yet. Perhaps because the, the local data model to accept and incorporate that kind of information does not exist uh, in a number of, um, of um, collection management systems. Again, it kind of touches on this annotation aspect. Yeah, and I see Beth has already asked the question, is that possible for us to those bionomia identifiers in um. well i'd strongly make you know make use of the uh you know the orchid and wikidata identifiers which i think you've you're, you're doing already that, that's that's the whole purpose of this is not like you know bionomia identifier you know is inconsequential to you um what's re what you're really after is you know the identifier that everyone can share and reuse in in a way um that is useful for a number of organizations Absolutely. David, and I, I think if it would fill that gap if we hadn't, yeah. sorry Beth, if we hadn't populated the ORCID ID for an agent, um, right. if we backfilled the, the binomi identifiers, uh, it would bridge that gap. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so the, the parsing business within binomi would at least show here are all the agents that are at least have you merged out to GBIF from your data holdings. And some of them have people associated with them, some of them don't. Uh, and so those, those are two kind of ways in which you can be presented with the entirety of the agent list, at least according to the parsing that has come out and see how, what's the coverage there? Are we 50%, 60%, 70% coverage of all of our agent lists versus the people? Um, and uh, again, my, my friend in Sweden who looks at that, you know, trying to get that up to 100%. I found every single agent in my list, I know who they are. Uh, 
So David, I was just thinking it would be really nice to be able to link to the binomial. One of the things that we can do when we're looking at the Arcus agent page is uh, you can see a list of what people have like collections they work in. But if you're logged into your own collection, you can't actually access, you have to log out and then go into the other profile and then look the person up. And it would be potentially just a fewer clicks if you could jump to the Bionomia and sit there and go, okay, in that collection, they were working all on birds. And in my collection, they're working on birds. So this is probably the same person versus if it was somebody working on flies, they probably, unless it was like bird parasites, Derek, and then, then it might be the same person. But uh, you also forgive me because my brain is I've been up since six as most of you guys. So you'll see, I'll just oh gosh. Like trail off. Or <laughs> yeah, the, well, I mean, that's one of the nice advantages of this is kind of using the people names as a pivot point to kind of examine, okay, where on all the collections in the world have has this person got their, their specimens deposited? They may have been an ornith ornithologist, they may have been a dipterist at parts of their life and they've kind of changed roles uh, and, and interests. And you're right, there is uh, uh, quite a, a varied array of people's interests throughout their lifetimes. And you know, it, it would be wonderful if there was a, a mechanism by which we could figure out who these people are because we're all com coming at it from different perspectives. I have a question on uh, claiming records in Bionomia. Um, is there a way to, they do an advanced kind of filter search like, okay, matching on my, this exact text string of Derek S. Sykes with, you know, Alaska or with Arthropoda or something, and then just say, okay, here's 3,000 records that hit those criteria. I'm just going to claim them all with yeah. one click yeah, instead of right. having to click on 3,000 different records. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Yeah, it's onerous <laughs> and pointless <laughs> at some level. There is an advanced search within that, within with your own profile or whether you're attributing specimens to someone else. And there's a, a pretty rudimentary kinds of ways that you can do so they're cross filtering like that. You can say here, here's the agent string that is likely to be me. And here are the taxon, here's the family that you know, I've been worked in, I worked on over the years. And here is the data set within which I know I've got specimens and you can add all those little bits and pieces together and, and, and then look at the subset as a result and just click through those. Likewise, you could download all of that if you were so inclined, um, do the attribution linking in an Excel spreadsheet and upload it back into Binomi. And that's the reason why some people have got four million, <laughs> three million attributions to them is because that's what they've done is they've downloaded the, the CSV file and added little addendums of recorded, identified as the actions and uploaded it. Yeah, so Derek, that's the only way to bulk bulk claim is through the uh, download upload process. There's no no way to do that through the website directly. Like well, there there is. I, I caught a binomial bot, um, and it is uh, it's an art at the moment, um, but. I've been kind of debating whether or not I should release this thing, but there is a magic bullet um, called the bot um, that where I, you can add a whole series of kind of refinements to that and kind of weird expression grammar. Um, and then I will occasionally execute that thing on my own with having some kind of confidence that I'm doing it well and press the button and whoop, you know, some 50,000 are automatically done. Um, I need to do a lot more experimenting on this and, and kicking the tires of it to make sure that it is foolproof. Um, but you know that that's one of the possibilities that uh, you know I've been kind of in the, I've been on the on the back burner for a while. Eric, I'll just say I've done the download upload thing, and it's pretty quick and simple. So, yeah, our Arctos people are used to that at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know Teresa's has claimed a lot of records for me. <laughs> so um, at the risk of being a bit provocative, um, 
you know, one of the things I do not know how best to represent is, you know, the canonical person's name. <laughs> what is that? You know, you've got all these potential variants of people's names expressed in various ways. Which one do you choose to show at the top of the page? Um, and so I, I've not made any decisions on that whatsoever. I don't know how to make that decision. I'll let that come from Wikidata and I'll let it come from ORCID. But have you had discussions internally about how best to do that? So I'm going to hop in here because I've been working on agent names for the last two weeks. <laughs> um, and I, I don't think we've actually had that conversation. Um, we do have what is called preferred name hmm. that I think some people view as, oh, this is the name I like to put on my labels. Um, and I personally, because of the way we use it, view it as a unique identifier. And so I want it to be the most complete name it can be, first, middle, last, suffixes, if they're there kind of thing. Um, but I don't think we've really talked about um, what's the name, if I go look at my agent page, what's the name that I want to appear at the top? And, you know, you are being provocative because it's probably going to be different for everybody. Yeah. And that, you know, there are cultural preferences that come into play as well, mm -hmm. um, which, are, you know, we, we, we should all be sensitive to. In some contexts, people prefer their name to be presented in one way, in other contexts, another. Mm -hmm. I think right now it's confusing, as Teresa mentioned, preferred is taken in multiple contexts. And I know Dusty, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is the, sort of the one name that is most important in terms of resolving agents in within Arctos. And um, it maybe should be called something other than preferred name. And we should have a separate category of something that would be to say the display name or the name that is exported to publishers. Yeah, I, preferred name is, is functional. It's got a unique key on it. And I, it's structured a certain way, which helps me keep duplicates out and things like that. Um, and I, I think we've probably outgrown that, or at least we've gotten to the point where we need to have a serious conversation about that. David, what do you, what do you have to say about duplicate names, John Smith, and how does, what is Bionomia? So we, yeah, interestingly, because I'm kind of approaching this from the reverse angle that you are, in essence, because I'm kind of, you know, given that we have all the stuff that might be coming from GBIF and put in all one big soup, um, I make no stance whatsoever about, you know, th there, there is a, an agent strings table within Binomia, but it's used solely for search. They are search tokens. What's important is that the context of that agent string, where it's represented, is the, the business, it's the meat behind it. So there's no problem. You've got John 25,000 John Smiths if you want. And they're, although they are unique within the agent's table in Binomia, it gets flushed out and destroyed every two weeks and rebuilt because they're search tokens. Um, the aliases in Binomia come from Wikidata or Orchid. What can we do, David, that would be most beneficial to you? I mean, and be, would it help you resolve some of your issues? Are there points where we can collaborate? I mean, because we're constantly tweaking our own model. We're mm -hmm. constantly having these discussions. And, uh, but it's internal. So this is a great opportunity to see, like, what, what could we do that would be, you know, have a broader impact? Are, do you have any suggestions? Or, well, I think, you know, you were watching uh, Tim and John uh, about the business of having agents and roles and such in where GBIF is going. I think, you know, in the Tadwig space, I think that's the logical place where we can all play um, and have a voice in the direction of where that goes. Um, I feel a little bit uh, uneasy about that agent role kind of uh, table, as I showed in the, in the first part of my presentation. If we could think about this in terms of actions and verbs about, you know, rather, you know, disentangle that a little bit. 
Um, I'm not sure if that's the right approach, but I think uh, in terms of the extensibility of being able to express multiple kinds of verse, verb based actions separate from roles uh, seems to make a bit of sense. So I, I would I would look to try and um, all of us trying to sort out whether you know what what Tim and John have presented there is is going to suit our needs or whether you know a slightly kind of different approach would would be useful. Um, I would really love to see all of you make use of the uh, the frictionless data downloads from Bionomia and sort through them. Say, is this useful for you? Um, and if it's not, um, then what, what you know? What can I do that would would make it a bit more streamlined and useful at your end? So I, I'd encourage you to you know download the, that frictionless data sets for each of your. Um, data sets to see does it correspond with uh, your notion of agents and or aliases and such at your end and is there a, a way that that, that can be, work a bit more effectively yeah i think links to those collection pages would be really useful for us to get so we don't have to create our own dash dashboard for some of these tools you've already created uh, for people who are just looking to clean up their data mm -hmm. How do you yeah. feel about web services? Uh, in in what in what way? Um, well, a bunch of the tools that you mentioned early in your talk are like things that are in Arctos, but we've probably done them much more cludgily uh, because at some point they needed to run in Oracle and now they needed to run in Postgres. Right. Um, and I would like to throw you a string because that's usually what we have when we're creating agents. Here's a Andy doll. Is it somebody we, we know, might know about and mm. see what comes back? I, I think that would be sort of the, the most impact you could have is sort of the pre-creation cleanup. Agreed. Yeah, yeah for sure. Even, you know, you know, specimen transcription platforms like notes from nature and such, when people yeah. are busily typing in people's names as they see them on the label, you know, wouldn't it be nice if they could also, in addition to doing that in copying down the verbatim data, also get some visual feedback about who, who that person may be. And so the, the web services out of Binomium might facilitate that a little bit. You know, they got that search widget um, uh, that could be made use of. There's also, you know, um, uh, web services uh, out of Binomium for, for other ways. You know, here's an occurrence record, show me everything that's already been linked. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, by all means, um, there is, relatively robust use of some of the, the API services out of Binomia. It's based off almost entirely elastic search, so it should be relatively performant. Um, but yeah, I, I would encourage you to see if, if, if they're of any use. Uh, and if, uh, if not, then you know, maybe we can make some adjustments there. On the other side of that, inside of Arctos, at least for some agents, we have a fair bit of data. We have mm -hmm. relationships to other agents. We have the earliest they've collected, the latest they've collected, stuff like that. Um, and I th think you, you can't get it from GBIF. GBIF is all concatenated strings. Um, but I think, I don't know, it's kind of a question for the Arctos community, but we could probably provide that to you if you could make use of it. Um, and of yeah, course, if you're consuming your web services, you know, it'd be a, a nice positive feedback loop there potentially. Yeah, that's right. Um, I, I have to sort out how best to do that, knowing that I, you know, the pull the data down from GBIF every two weeks and destroy them all, rebuild it all again. Right. Um, and how then could you additionally put in fingers in that process from other sources such as Arctos? Um, I think there's an opportunity there. I'll just have to do it in such a way that I'm not going to mistakenly <laughs> disconnect something that was useful um, because there are data coming from GBIF that may partially overlap with something coming from somewhere else. Right. Well, we may stop sending GBIF concatenated strings at some point too, which might make that all seamless. I don't know yeah. how realistic that is at this point. Right. Yeah, I was going to echo that, Dusty, because we do a lot of work about disambiguating names and not the same as relationships um, and yeah, collaborations, familial um, relationships. So we do have a lot of um, metadata about each agent that would be so I, I think there's an opportunity there to do some exploratory paper writing and analyses. So I, likewise in Binomia, I've got a not them, not me button. I have done nothing with any of that information. Uh, and the, clearly there's some opportunities there to do some AI or machine learning on that because here's some negative information 
that would allow the attribution or linkages to other people um, based on what was clearly declared as a, a not kind of relationship, a negative relationship. And those are really valuable things in, in AI and, and machine learning. And if you've got some of that stuff too, and I got some of that stuff, I think, you know, we should do something with that. Yeah, I sometimes feel like, so the things that Emily just talked about, um, we could be benefiting the broader community if we would just work on loading all of that to Wikidata. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I agree as well, but that's starting to look like a full-time job. <laughs> not, yeah. not good to do it in my spare time. But, but the idea, I mean, to me, the idea behind that is that eventually we stop maintaining all of this stuff in our little sphere and we just use the public information at Wikidata. Yeah, I mean, Arctos is set up for that. They try to build everything so if somebody does it better, we can just plug in. Um, Will there be some situations similarly to what we have with other types of identifiers where you have assertion relationships that this person is the same as, this person is not the same as, and there may be conflicting views on that. And can that be resolved within Wikidata or I guess Binomia would resolve it? Um, like, again, it comes down to the linkages and the context with which they're expressed, right? You'd have to say it, it's not this person because. Mm -hmm. There's some linkage to something else that, that gives the evidence for why that person is not the same. Uh, and that's, I'm not entirely certain whether or not Wikidata is going to answer that to that level of granularity because you will never have specimen data in Wikidata. Maybe types, <laughs> but not the several billion records that are, you know, in, in potentially many more in, in GBIF, you know, Wikidata will not be able to handle that. Well, it is uh, 11 past the hour, so I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, but I wanted to thank you all for attending and thank you especially to David for sharing more about Bionomia. And I, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, points of collaboration that we can uh, explore, integrating tools and such. So um, yeah, look forward to, to talking more. Yeah, you, me, me too. Um, we'll keep, keep the channels open. If you've got problems, you know, ping me uh, and see if there's something that we can come up with uh, in the way of a solution. More than I happy anticipate to. we'll have a lot of GitHub issues posted shortly about how we can integrate some of these uh, yeah, wonderful. tools. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, thanks David. All. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Well, take care. Thanks,